August 5th. Well, we begin reading a brand new book in the Old Testament today. We'll be looking into the book of Ezra for the first time. And we'll begin, of course, chapter 1, verse 1. We'll go through chapter 2, verse 70. Now, this book of Ezra opens with the closing words of Second Chronicles, for God's plan was not finished. Judah had rejected Jeremiah's warning, but the prophet's words came true. God is at work in human history. His purposes will be accomplished, regardless of the nation's activities. Jeremiah warned of coming judgment, but he also promised restoration, and the promise was fulfilled. From God's word to the king's word, Cyrus fulfilled a prophecy given a century and a half before. God can use even a pagan ruler to accomplish his divine purposes. When the words and actions of world leaders disturb you, just remember that God is still on the throne and has things in control. Not all the Jews of the captivity wanted to return to a desolate land. Some of those who did not go at least encouraged the others and helped with the expenses, as did some of their Babylonian neighbors. Now the trip was difficult, and life in the land was demanding. However, the courageous Jews paid the price to do God's will. No matter how you may have failed in the past, God gives you an opportunity for a brand new beginning. He is the God who makes all things new again. And with that, let's begin our reading today in the Old Testament. August 5th. Today we're reading from the book of Ezra, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. We'll go through chapter 2, verse 70. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled Jeremiah's prophecy by stirring the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation into writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem in the land of Judah. All of you who are his people may return to Jerusalem in Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives in Jerusalem. And may your God be with you. Those who live in any place where Jewish survivors are found should contribute toward their expenses by supplying them with silver and gold, supplies for the journey, and livestock as well as a free will offering for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then God stirred the hearts of the priests and Levites, and the leaders of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of the Lord. And all their neighbors assisted by giving them vessels of silver and gold, supplies for the journey and livestock. They gave them many choice gifts in addition to all the free will offerings. King Cyrus himself brought out the valuable items which King Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the Lord's temple in Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his own gods. Cyrus directed Mithradath, the treasurer of Persia, to count these items and present them to Sheshbazar, the leader of the exiles returning to Judah. These were the items Cyrus donated. Gold trays, 30. Silver trays, 1,000. Silver censers, 29. Gold bowls, 30. Silver bowls, 410. Other items, 1,000. In all, 5,400 gold and silver items were turned over to Sheshbazar to take back to Jerusalem when the exiles returned there from Babylon. Here is the list of the Jewish exiles of the provinces who returned from their captivity to Jerusalem and to the other towns of Judah. They had been deported to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. Their leaders were Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sarariah, Realiah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpar, Bigvai, Rehum, and Bahana. This is the number of men of Israel who returned from exile. The family of Shephatiah, 372. The family of Ara, 775. The family of Pehath Moab, Descendants of Jeshua and Joab, 2,812. The family of Elam, 1,254. The family of Zatu, 945. The family of Zakai, 760. The family of Mani, 642. The family of Bibai, 
six hundred twenty three. The family of Azgad, one thousand two hundred twenty two. The family of Adonikam, six hundred sixty six. The family of Bigvi, two thousand fifty six. The family of Aden, four hundred fifty four. The family of Ater, descendants of Hezekiah, ninety eight. The family of Bizai, three hundred twenty three. The family of Jorah, one hundred twelve. The family of Hashum, two hundred twenty three. The family of Gibar, ninety five. The people of Bethlehem, one hundred twenty three. The people of Netopha, fifty six. The people of Anathoth, one hundred twenty eight. The people of Beth Asmaveth, forty two. The peoples of Kiriath Jarim, Kephira, and Beeroth, seven hundred forty three. The peoples of Ramah and Geba, six hundred twenty one. The peoples of Michmash, one hundred twenty two. The peoples of Bethel and Ai, two hundred twenty three. The citizens of Nebo, fifty two. The citizens of Magbish, one hundred fifty six. The citizens of Elam, one thousand two hundred fifty four. The citizens of Harim, three hundred twenty. The citizens of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, seven hundred twenty five. The citizens of Jericho, three hundred forty five. The citizens of Sinaha, three thousand six hundred thirty. These are the priests who returned from exile. The family of Jediah, through the line of Jeshua, nine hundred seventy three. The family of Emer, one thousand fifty two. The family of Pashur, one thousand two hundred forty seven. The family of Harim, one thousand seventeen. These are the Levites who returned from exile. The families of Jeshua and Kadmael, descendants of Hodaviah, seventy-four. The singers of the family of Asaph, one hundred twenty-eight. The gatekeepers of the families of Shalom, Ater, Talmon, Akgub, Hatita, and Shobai, one hundred thirty-nine. The descendants of the following temple servants returned from exile. Ziha, Hasutha, Tebaoth, Kiros, Siha, Padon, Lebanai, Hagabah, Akub, Hagab, Shalmai, Hanan, Gedel, Gehar, Rehaya, Rizin, Nekoda, Gazam, Uza, Pazia, Bisai, Azna, Mehunim, Nefusim, Bakbuk, Hakufa, Harhur, Basluth, Mihida, Harsha, Barkos, Sisera, Tima, Neziah, and Hatipha. The descendants of these servants of King Solomon returned from exile Sotai, Sophareth, Peruda, Jaila, Darkan, Gidel, Shephatiah, Hatil, Hokirith Hazabaim, and Amai. In all, the temple servants and the descendants of Solomon's servants numbered 392. Another group returned to Jerusalem at this time from the towns of Telmela, Telharsha, Karub, Adan, and Immer. However, they could not prove that they or their families were descendants of Israel. This group consisted of the families of Deliah, Tobiah, and Nicoda, a total of 652 people. Three families of priests, Hobiah, Hakoz, and Barzillai, also returned to Jerusalem. This Barzillai had married a woman who was a descendant of Barzillai of Gilead, and he had taken her family name. But they had lost their genealogical records, so they were not allowed to serve as priests. The governor would not even let them eat the priest's share of food from the sacrifices, until there was a priest who could consult the Lord about the matter by means of sacred lots. So a total of 42,360 people returned to Judah. In addition to 7,337 servants and 200 singers, both men and women, they took with them 736 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels, and 6,720 donkeys. When they arrived at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, some of the family leaders gave generously toward the rebuilding of God's temple on its original site, 
and each leader gave as much as he could. The total of their gifts came to 61,000 gold coins, 6,250 pounds of silver, and 100 robes for the priests. So the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, the temple servants, and some of the common people settled in villages near Jerusalem. The rest of the people returned to other towns of Judah from which they had come. August 5th. Today, as we open the New Testament, it'll be uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. We'll go through chapter 2, verse 5. Now, Corinth, the capital of Achaia, was perhaps the richest and most important city in Greece, and it was also the most corrupt. A center for trade, Corinth was invaded by all kinds of religions and philosophies. Paul founded the Corinthian church during his second missionary journey, and he ministered there for a year and a half. After he left, serious problems developed in the church, and Paul wrote the members a stern letter that was not successful. He heard that the church was divided, and then a delegation from the church arrived in Ephesus with a letter asking Paul's help regarding specific questions. 1 Corinthians was his response. Paul dealt with sin in the church, and then he answered the questions they asked. As we begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, even though believers are all one in Christ Jesus, the local church often suffers from division. Why? Well, for one thing, we forget the calling we have in Christ. It is only by God's grace that we have been called, and this fact should humble us and encourage us to love one another. Another factor is our tendency to follow human leaders and develop a fan club mentality. Christ died for us and lives to bless us, and He must have the preeminence. A third factor is dependence on human wisdom and philosophies, of which there were many in Corinth. And, of course, there are a lot today. The world's wisdom had crept into the church, and it did not mix with the wisdom of God. Various theologies are the attempts of scholars to interpret the Word of God. But they are not the Word. Never allow them to be a cause of division. And as we begin reading in chapter 2, we'll read about power. Paul did not imitate the itinerant teachers in Corinth who depended on their eloquence and intellectual brilliance. Paul's faith was in God, not in himself. He wanted sinners to trust in Christ's power. Now, you may think you lack ability to serve God, but God can turn your weakness into strength. See, the gospel still works. And with that, let's begin our reading today in the New Testament. August 5th, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. We'll go through chapter 2 and verse 5. I, Paul, know very well how foolish the message of the cross sounds to those who are on the road to destruction. But we who are being saved recognize this message as the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy human wisdom and discard their most brilliant ideas. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made them all look foolish and has shown their wisdom to be useless nonsense. Since God in His wisdom saw to it that the world would never find Him through human wisdom, He has used our foolish preaching to save all who believe. God's way seems foolish to the Jews because they want a sign from heaven to prove it is true. And it is foolish to the Greeks because they believe only what agrees with their own wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the mighty power of God and the wonderful wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is far wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is far stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, the few of you who were wise in the world's eyes, or powerful, or wealthy when God called you, Instead, God deliberately chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. 
and He chose those who are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important, so that no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God alone made it possible for you to be in Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made Christ to be wisdom itself. He is the one who made us acceptable to God. He made us pure and holy, and He gave Himself to purchase our freedom. As the Scriptures say, the person who wishes to boast should boast only of what the Lord has done. Dear brothers and sisters, when I first came to you, I didn't use lofty words and brilliant ideas to tell you God's message. For I decided to concentrate only on Jesus Christ and His death on the cross. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling, and my message and my preaching were very plain. I did not use wise and persuasive speeches, but the Holy Spirit was powerful among you. I did this so that you might trust the power of God rather than human wisdom. Today we're reading in Psalm 27, verses 7 through 14. What makes you afraid? Darkness? But the Lord is your light. Danger? He is also your salvation. Deficiency? He is your strength. Then why be afraid? See what He does for you. God saves you. Because He was not a priest, David could not actually go into the tabernacle but he could still rest in the Lord and trust Him as his refuge. The New Testament equivalent for this is abide in me. In Him is perfect safety. God smiles on you. You must go beyond merely seeking God's help. Seek His face. The smile of God is all you need to overcome the scowls of men. And God shows you the way. Satan wants to trap you. But the Lord will show you the safe way. Believe His promise and walk by faith. His goodness will be with you. Oh, and very important, God strengthens you. We need strength for the battle and strength for the journey, don't we? And God abundantly provides. Be sure to take time to wait on the Lord. If you run ahead of Him or lag behind, you'll be a perfect target for the enemy. Psalm 27, verses 7 through 14. Listen to my pleading, O Lord. Be merciful and answer me. My heart has heard you say, Come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. Do not hide yourself from me. Do not reject your servant in anger. You have always been my helper. Don't leave me now. Don't abandon me, O God of my salvation. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. Teach me how to live, O Lord. Lead me along the path of honesty, for my enemies are waiting for me to fall. Do not let me fall into their hands, for they accuse me of things I have never done and breathe out violence against me. Yet I am confident that I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of the living. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Proverbs 20, verses 22 and 23. Don't say, I will get even for this wrong. Wait for the Lord to handle the matter. The Lord despises double standards. He is not pleased by dishonest scales. <laughs>